Welcome to Transacting Value, where we talk about practical applications for personal values when dealing with each other and even within ourselves, where we foster a podcast listening experience that lets you hear the power of a value system for managing burnout, establishing boundaries, and finding belonging. My name is Josh Porthouse. I'm your host, and we are your people. This is why values still hold value. This is Transacting Value. A lot of people have the attitude, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Go right ahead. Live your life that way if you want to. I have too much to live for. So you can have that attitude or you can say, okay, it's past time for me to start making some changes and I'm going to salvage whatever I have with the rest of my life. Most adults are familiar with questions like, Daddy, why are you working all the time? Or Mommy, how come you're never home for dinner? Or why am I not getting better? And many of us have even asked ourselves, How am I supposed to do everything at once? How am I supposed to take care of you when I can't even remember who I am anymore? Our next contributor is a travel nurse. He moves between hospitals a few months at a time to continue trying to answer questions like these for his patients and their families. From being an army medic and even treating his own stressors and disease, Keith recovered his mental health and relied on his values to understand that he had a choice, even when he felt sorry for himself. We all do. Today, we're talking our January core values of self-discipline, self-improvement, and tenacity. So if you're new to the podcast, welcome. And if you're a continuing listener, welcome back. Without further ado, folks, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. Keith, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm well, man. I'm doing great. How are you doing? Great. Great. I appreciate you taking some time out of your schedule, though, to come and talk and hang out for a little bit, man. There's a lot of stuff, and I'm only saying this not because I'm a nurse or really have any medical background, but my ex-wife is not a travel nurse. She's an LPN down in Florida, and she works what I think are pretty ridiculous shifts four 12 hour days or three 12 hour days at a time and back to back in most cases. And then a couple Mm -hmm. days off, right? So like being emotionally distant from your family or trying to balance work and life while focusing on patients and their well being and their mental health. I can only imagine how much time it takes out of your day to reset and be you. So taking a little free time out of your weekend, I appreciate coming to share it with us, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and I'm glad to be desired anyway. But yeah, it's wonderful to be here. You know, I appreciate that. Yeah, desired's a good word. Desired's a good word. There's a lot of people in the world, even in the U.S., let alone the world for that matter, where, like I said earlier, stress is just a part of life, but you don't have the luxury of time to process it when you're working in a hospital. Like other people's lives dictate your time. This is true because we're there for people. I tell patients all the time, look, we're here for you. Don't ever think that you're taking up too much of our time or that when you're talking to your provider, your physician, your nurse practitioner, whoever that might be, don't ever think that you are taking them away from them because you're the priority. But yeah, I get a lot out of doing what I do for my patients. So a lot of times, and I know this is not true for a lot of people, when I'm working, that's kind of a stress release for me because I so enjoy what I do and taking care of patients is, you know, my livelihood, but it's also a calling for me. And it uh, brings me great satisfaction and great joy to take a person from feeling bad or scared or nervous and encouraging them that they're going to get a good outcome. And then when I see them after they've had their procedure done or whatever treatment and they're feeling better, that's a great uplifting experience for me. I bet. So I've, I've been in the hospital a couple of times, not really for anything major, but to see people develop, I guess, that kind of emotional resonance with patients, nurses, doctors, specifically staff, develop that kind of resonance with patients and then actually grow through the process with them or spiritually or emotionally or whatever. There's obviously a lot of physical recovery at a hospital, but what would you say is greater, the physical recovery or like the mental health and spiritual recovery of some of these patients? In terms of process, the physical recovery is, you know, can be grueling depending on what you get done. Sure. But your mental health, mental recovery is far greater (laughs) an asset for you, I think, because, you know, we had talked about this before. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health, if not more. Mental health can affect your physical. You can have physical symptoms because of mental anguish and, and mental health. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'll give you a prime example. What I do in the hospital, I work in a procedure lab where we take care of patients who have heart disease in various forms. You know, the most common one is coronary artery disease. And dude, I mean, I'm telling you, I see people who are in great shape. They do all the things that they're supposed to do. They 
take care of all of their modifiable risk factors. I mean, like they don't smoke, they eat well, they exercise, they do all that, but they have severe disease because of stress. We can't necessarily pen the paper and show you, okay, this is these are your stressors. This is what's causing you to have coronary artery disease. But if you eliminate all other factors, stress is the only one that's there. And um, it was it had been a lot more common for men to have heart disease and coronary artery disease because men tend to be more type A personality, whatever that means to you. And I don't like to be vague when we talk about cliche type things and say type A personalities. I mean, people who are high strung, high stress, they're going all the time. And there's a lot of distress in their life. You know, there's different types of stress. There's distress, there's you stress, and I think I'm leaving one out. But the distress, the negative stress, a lot of that definitely, absolutely can manifest itself in the physical symptoms, for sure. I mean, you had some issues, not to dive into your medical history, but you had some issues that you worked through too, right? And so that was what, on your perspective and choices? Or, or like, how did you fix that for yourself? Well, <laughs> I would like to tell you that I had this epiphany one day and say, hey, you need to start doing some things differently. I think all of us have those thoughts. You know, I, everybody does things that they shouldn't do and they know that they shouldn't do them. And if you continue to do them, it's going to cause some issues. So, well, the same thing happened to me. You know, I was not taking great care of myself and being in the medical field. It makes no sense. You know, like, but, you know, trust me, I'm not the only one. There's plenty. <laughs> But I was smoking. I was drinking in excess. One of the things that I did, not really knowingly, this is why I was doing it. When I first started traveling away from my family, that was a stressful period for me. And I self-medicated myself with alcohol, too much of it, and not eating well, not exercises. And I ended up, you know, I had diabetes, high blood pressure, and that, that ended up causing me to have kidney disease. Mm. And the kidney disease was scary. You mentioned in my introduction that I worked in dialysis, and I did. Yeah. And I remember working in the clinics and seeing these patients and, and the treatments that they went through. For those that don't know, dialysis is three and a half to four hours a day, three days a week. Ooh. When you have to go in the clinic and sit on a machine and basically, it, I could go into details, but I'm not. It's take up too much time. But basically, it pulls fluid and toxins out of a person's body by taking blood out of their body, going through a machine and putting the blood back. So that can cause some discomfort, <laughs> to yeah. say the least, for the patient. And I just remember looking at that and thinking to myself, never, ever is that going to be me. Well, you know, here I am, got diagnosed with kidney disease because I was being treated for something else. All righty, folks, sit tight. and We'll be right back on Transacting Value. Did you know that children who do chores to earn their allowance have more respect for finance and more of a drive for financial independence? Did you know that families who complete tasks together have stronger bonds? Did you know that cognition, sense of self, and anxiety all improve if people have regular interactions with nature? Imagine what instilling self-esteem, resilience, family, teamwork, and an authorized sense of self could do for the growth of each generation, no matter the temptation. At Hoof and Clucker Farm, that's just another Tuesday. Want to learn how to homestead or just more effectively develop your character for an unknown future? Follow or direct message on Instagram at Hoof and Clucker Farm. Watch it happen in real time. And I just remember looking at that and thinking to myself, never, ever is that going to be me. Well, you know, here I am, got diagnosed with kidney disease because I was being treated for something else. They checked my lab work to make sure that the treatment was effective and it cured this disease that I had. And it did. It was effective. I don't have that. It was hepatitis C is what I had. I don't have it anymore. But they checked my labs to make to see that it worked and it did. But they also checked my kidney function and my kidney function was compromised. And it got worse and worse very rapidly. And I was staring dialysis right in the face. Something that I said I would never go through. I would never put myself through. And here I am staring it right in the face. And... When you're faced with that kind of news, you can respond to that in one or two different ways. You know, a lot of people have the attitude, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead. Live your life that way if you want to. I have too much to live for, so I don't want to have that attitude. So you can have that attitude or you can say, OK, it's past time for me to start making some changes and I'm going to salvage whatever I have with the rest of my life. 
That's the decision I made. So I stopped doing everything. I had already stopped smoking cigarettes like a year or two prior to that. I immediately stopped drinking. I changed my diet. I started exercising regularly. I mean, dude, I was probably about 270 pounds. To put that in perspective, I'm about 6'3", somewhere between 6'2 and 6'3". Yeah. I had like a 46, 48-inch waist. I looked like an apple with legs. <laughs> and so I started that process. And now over the course of the last two and a half years, I've lost over 80 pounds. I've lost about 14 inches off my waist. My wife took a picture of me. She looked at me laying on the bed. And she could see my rib cage and she was like fascinated by this. She was like, oh my God, he had... <laughs> she knew me when I was small. Like when I graduated from high school, I was about 6'1 and I weighed 133 pounds. Oh. Yeah. I, people look at me like, hey, you're so thin. I said, dude, I was like 70 pounds lighter than I am now. Jeez. Uh, but I'm a lot more muscular now than I was back then, too, because you know, I've been working out. So yeah, that exercise and diet change. And then I got educated. If I can give anybody some good advice. Now, I also believe that advice is usually never wanted. It's always needed, but people just don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And the people who usually don't want to hear it are the ones that need to hear it the most. But that's just a personal opinion. I'm not saying that that's fact or anything. But people don't know the folks in their life. But the best advice I can ever give anybody is to get educated about whatever issues you have in your life. Get educated about them. I got educated about my kidney disease. I got educated about my health. It has made all the difference in the world. Even in the books that I read, it always says, we learned as children, reading is fundamental. It absolutely is. Everything T.D. Jakes famously said, that, well, I don't know how famous he was for saying it, but he said it in a sermon that I heard him preach, you become what you read. You think about it. Okay, I'm a nurse, right? I did more. I was not a reader before nursing school. And I wasn't a reader after I didn't come become I didn't really become a reader until I joined an organization where self-improvement was really stressed. That's when I became a, an avid reader. So that's we're talking about 13 years ago was uh-huh. when I did that. But nursing school, I kind of turned me off on me because we did more. Re- I did more reading in nursing school than I ever had done in my entire life I in bet. that period. Of time. I bet. Being in the military, I don't know what they did in the Marines, but in the, in the Army, we got this book, Basic Military Training. The BMT book was what it was. And yeah. it was we had to finish that whole book before basic training was over. We finished it, but it was a thick book. And they told us we were going to read everything in there, and we did. But it taught you how to be a soldier. Reading all the stuff that I read in nursing school taught me how to be a nurse. So whatever it is, whatever issues you have, whatever problems you have, that relationship that you want to improve, you can improve all of those by reading. Get educated. So anyway, I got educated on my disease. Read two books primarily about kidney disease. Stopping Kidney Disease and the Stopping Kidney Disease Diet. The author is Lee Hull, and he has an organization called Kidney. I'm not advertising for him. I'm not a sponsor. I use this is the stuff that I use. He is a kidney patient himself and has been one for over 20 years. <laughs> I kind of hate to say this, but it's true. Mainstream medical advances take 50 years to to become mainstream. From the time that they are discovered till they are commonly used in practice, that period of time takes around 50 years. The advice that you get from physicians and some healthcare professionals is probably generally very old and not necessarily best practice. Well, let me ask you this then that might sharpen that time curve a little bit, or if that's the right expression, shorten it, I guess. The advice we're getting from doctors, the advice we're getting from nurses, or or just medical professionals, let's say, if it's practical, but all things considered older and, you know, maybe outdated or whatever, what do you think about, I guess, this proposition? As far as individuals go, and I don't know, maybe not self-medicating, but self-therapy, let's call it. You mentioned not taking care of yourself, even though you're in the medical field. You mentioned coping and self-medicating, and you mentioned obviously educating yourself and working through some stuff as well to process and learn more. In making that choice for yourself, though, what role did your values have or a value system have? Like, for example, self-discipline in pushing you through that or any of your other values that maybe gave you something to stand on and work through at your pace while the doctors and medical staff worked based on what they knew? Great question. A lot of it came from mentorship and being around, getting around people who were successful in various things and listening to them 
and not necessarily taking their advice, but taking the information that they provided and finding the value in it to do or sometimes to not do. (laughs) I can keep mentioning that I read a lot. Well, also uh, the information that you gather from listening to successful people, you know, audio tapes, going to seminars, reading their books and things like that. It helps you develop a value system. And that also came from my upbringing. I grew up in a two parent home, a mother and father, and they were both very hard workers. You know, so that value and that work ethic was instilled in me as well. But as you inundate your mind with good, positive things and self-discipline, it helps. And let's say when you start changing your life, when I started to change my life in a positive way to make these improvements, the foundational piece of those values played a huge part in getting me to where I needed to go. The daily habits that we do and listening to things like John Maxwell said, you will never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret to your success is found in your daily routine. I was drinking every day. I was not exercising every day. I was eating poorly every day. I had to turn that around. All righty, folks, sit tight. and We'll be right back on Transacting Value. Alrighty, folks, here at Transacting Value, we write and produce all the material for our podcast in-house, gain perspective alongside you, our listeners, and exchange vulnerability and dialogue with our contributors every Monday morning. But for distribution, Buzzsprout's a platform to use. You want to know how popular you are in Europe or how Apple is a preferred platform to stream your interviews? Buzzsprout can do that. You want to stream on multiple players through an RSS or custom feed or even have references and resources to take your podcast professionalism? authenticity, and presence to a wider audience? Buzzsprout can do that too. Here's how. Start with some gear that you already have in a quiet space. If you want to upgrade, Buzzsprout has tons of guides to help you find the right equipment at the right price. Buzzsprout gets your show listed in every major podcast platform. You'll get a great looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and more. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Plus, following the link in the show notes lets Buzzsprout know we sent you, gets you a $20 credit if you sign up for a paid plan, and helps support our show. You want more value for your values? Buzzsprout can do that too. The secret to your success is found in your daily routine. I was drinking every day. I was not exercising every day. I was eating poorly every day. I had to turn that around. The daily habits became eating better, exercising on a regular basis, and not drinking. All that changing my value system from not really having one at all or uh, one on the back burner, but all the time, still listening to things, still reading, even though I wasn't performing, wasn't practicing. You know, like they, yeah, yeah. common sense, right? Common sense is not always common practice. Amen. We know what to do, but we just don't do it. You have to take it and put it into action. So I was not putting it into action. Even though I had the foundation of values, I wasn't putting it into action. The graveyard is full of good intentions. Mm-hmm. The graveyard is full of good intentions. Well, so let me ask you this then, talking about how you applied and stood on and built your foundation around these values. This is a segment of the show called Developing, Developing Character. character. Developing, Developing character. character. So it's two questions if you're new to the show. And Keith, it's entirely up to you how in-depth and vulnerable you want to be as you answer them. But when we're talking about what values did for you and your values specifically and their impact, well, let's talk about what some of those values were or are. So my first question is, when you were growing up, what were some of your values, aside from hard work, for example, that you were exposed to and that you learned about? I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were Catholic. I mean, I guess technically they still are. I'm no longer Catholic, but I'm still a Christian. I'm still a believer. So that definitely is the first number one value that was instilled in me as a child. In Proverbs, it says, train the child in the way they should go. And when they become older, they will not depart from it. Hmm. I'm a strong believer in that. Whether you are a Christian or not, that statement holds true regardless. How you are taught as a child can, not always will, can carry over into adulthood, and it should manifest itself into that. Even though I grew up in a very racist town, racism was not taught in my household. It was frowned upon. I mean, you know, we just, we treated everybody the same. 
Mm. You know, we talked about work ethic already. Both my parents worked and just the camaraderie and being a provider. My father was one of the, still in my mind is the hardest working man I ever knew in my life, but he made sure that we had what we needed for our family. So I'm the same kind of person with my family, you know, making sure that they have all the things that they need and the relationships that I have with my parents and with my brother and sister. And we had a really big sense of community where I grew up. I mean, it's kind of gone by the wayside in these days. There's the cliche or expression, it takes a village mm-hmm. to raise a child. Really had that in my neighborhood. You couldn't get away with a lot of stuff because everybody knew everybody and they would go back and tell your parents on you, you know. <laughs> so it was hard to escape, which was good. I mean, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, so things, you know, it's a different time now. But even back then, we had single parent homes and, and, things of that nature, but it didn't deter from the sense of community that we had there. Well, so, okay, then what about now? I mean, over time, obviously, you've grown and you've gained a lot of life experience. So what are some of your values now? I'm um, 51. I don't know what that means to everybody, but I've had a lot of epiphanies here over the past, I would say, three to 10 years. One of the things is, I believe the most important thing in your life now and forever are the relationships that you have with other people. Mm. Those you care about, okay? And those that care about you. And even if you have to interact with another person, we all have to do this at least once a day, if not with anyone else, yourself. Sure. Okay. Having a good relationship with yourself, liking yourself. You know, that sounds very cliche, but it's real. You should like yourself and you should like the kind of person that you are. And if you don't, you have an obligation to fix that, okay? You can change. Nobody can change you, but you can change yourself. The relationship I have with me, valuing myself, is very important, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, and all of that. And if you can't have a good relationship with yourself, it would be very difficult to have good relationships with other people. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of the reason when I got married, it didn't end well (laughs) because I didn't know me. I didn't know who I was. I lost sight of myself. I was, if I was physically distant, that was one thing, right? We had training, we had deployments, we had whatever. But even when I was physically present, I was mentally distant or emotionally gone, you know, and just not really there. Plus, I didn't really have any clarity in who I wanted to be or what direction I was going or how I wanted to interact with people or represent myself or really much of anything. I just sort of lost sight of it. Now, you were a medic in the Army. Most of my career has been in the infantry with the Marines. And so I think there's a lot of overlap there, unless you worked primarily in a hospital, I guess. But No, I was a field. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there you go. We had a lot of Navy corpsmen that would come out with us, and it was the same principle, right, where you just, you're just out and your focus is there in that right. moment. But a lot of the time, yeah. you develop a tendency, I guess you could say, to bring your work home with you, and you stay out there in the field mentally. Sure. And so when you have to work through splitting up essentially your well-being, you know, sleep in eight to 10 hours or whatever you need to recover, exercise, diet, family time, quality time with people you care about, and then going to work at the hospital where you're not necessarily able to sleep that long, that often, take naps, take care of yourself. How do you balance the two? You know, making sure you have time to work out and eat healthy and not just hit a vending machine every two hours or whatever. Well, one of my favorite People that I've listened to, I mean, he wouldn't know that he was my mentor, but he is. It's Jim Rohn. One of the things he would say is make sleep a necessity, not an objective. I used to sleep a lot. (laughs) I don't anymore because you don't need that much sleep. And I will tell you this, when you get healthier, you start taking better care of yourself. You don't require as much sleep. That's new. That's new? Yeah. Right. Sleep eight hours a day and you're going to be healthier the more you sleep. You know, what do you mean? Six to eight. Yeah, what do you mean? Six to eight is what you need. I mean, you don't necessarily need. I mean, and that, I guess that varies per person. But I still get six to eight hours of sleep every night. But I go to bed earlier so I can get up earlier. And I'm very organized now compared to what I was before. So I have my schedule. And no matter what, even if I sometimes so basically with the sleep thing, I'm saying is sometimes I have to make exceptions to that rule. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't do that long term. But sometimes you may have to have make exceptions to that rule so that you can get the things done that you have to get done. What's more important? You have to prioritize. 
I'm at a point in my life now and was at a point in my life then when I got diagnosed that I had to make changes or I was going to end up in a dialysis chair three times a week for four hours a day. All righty, folks, sit tight and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to George Washington in 1787 that agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will, in the end, contribute most to wealth, good morals, and happiness. Did you know that even at a nearly $1 billion valuation, farmers markets nationwide still authentically serve their local markets as direct-to-consumer, farm-fresh models of freedom, self-reliance, and teamwork? At the Keystone Farmers Market in Odessa, Florida, those same ideals also cultivate an agritourism experience, preserving the old ways of wholesome, family-oriented, sustainable growth of produce and people. For premium quality produce at affordable prices, opportunities for the kiddos to feed the baby cows, or to simply wander the garden and watch your future meals grow, visit Keystone Farmers Market on Facebook, or come by in person to 12615 Tarbon Springs Road. Keystone Farmers Market, the place with the boiled peanuts. I'm at a point in my life now and was at a point in my life then when I got diagnosed that I had to make changes or I was going to end up in a dialysis chair three times a week for four hours a day. Yeah. Which means several things, Porter, several things. I'm a traveling nurse. I couldn't do that. I'm a nurse, period. I don't know how I could maintain a job working as a nurse where I have to be in a chair nine to 12 hours a week. Mm. That's going to take away from my schedule. What could I do? I couldn't do anything that involves patient care, which is what I love. Okay, I love to take care of patients. There's plenty of desk jobs. There's plenty of administration jobs that require a nursing license and a degree. I don't want to do any of them. Okay, mm-hmm. except for I'm going to school currently to be a uh, nursing instructor, a faculty member. Oh, nice. So I'm doing I'm doing all that right now. You know, I'm, I'm getting up, yeah. I'm exercising. I eat right. I work full time. I go to school full time, and I'm and I have a family. My three youngest kids are with us right now. So I mean. Any of y'all that have children out there, you don't ever stop raising them. Okay. As long as you're still alive, <laughs> you keep raising them. Know that. So I prioritize. I make sure. So if I have to get a little bit less sleep tonight to make sure that I get up and go at least walk in the morning, I do my exercise. I do, I stretch every morning. I do push ups. I do ab work. I walk at least 30 minutes to an hour, five days a week, sometimes six days a week. 30 minutes and sometimes- to an hour. Yeah. And that requires me to, yeah. So I have to get up earlier. Yeah, That requires me times to get up at three. I've gotten up as early as three forty-five in the morning because I have to be at work. Depending on where I am, the location I'm working at anywhere from six to seven 30, depending on where I am. So I have to be at work that early in order to get everything I need to get done in a day. I started earlier on the front end. A lot of people have said, eat the big frogs first. What that means is the most important things, the things that you have to get done, you do them in the morning so that they're done. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you, as a person that exercises on a regular basis, if you get up in the morning when you're the most rested because you've slept all night, that's when you're going to have the most energy to do the things that require the most energy. And exercise requires a lot of energy. So mm-hmm. get it done and it provides you with energy throughout the day. So I just, I get up early, I do what I have to get done and I make sure and I stay organized to make sure the things that I still am working on the organizational part because I'm kind of stubborn when it comes to planning. (laughs) I'm getting better with it, you know, and constant improvement is something that we all need to embrace because you're never going to be 100% perfect. Everything that man has done can be duplicated and improved and everything that you're doing in your life is not, you're never going to be able to do it the best you can do all the time. So you should try to strive to try to do it. It doesn't mean it's because you're not going to ever be the best at it that you shouldn't try. No, Bruce Lee said, sometimes a goal is not meant to be reached. This is something to simply aim at. Yep. doesn't mean you don't try. It means you, you do and you, and the results will be there. I never had to tell anybody that I was making changes. I didn't have to tell anybody that I was losing weight. I didn't have to tell anybody that I was eating better. They could see it. Mm -hmm. If you start changes in your life, people will see it and it will tell you about it. And it makes you feel good. Yeah. People used to tell me that I was overweight and fat and make fun of me and make me feel bad. uh, I didn't let it make me feel bad. It was motivation. But still, you know, and I know that some people have difficulty with that. They struggle with that. And that's it's harmful to them. So you really shouldn't do that. 
However, if you are a friend to a person, you should be comfortable with sitting them down or maybe pull them to the side and say, hey, man, you need to make some changes with your life. You know? Yeah, yeah. Let me ask uh, you this real quick. And this, for the sake of time, is uh, going to be my last question. But on the days when you wake up and you say, nah, not today, <laughs> how do you push through those? What keeps you going? Well, we do have to take rest days. And sometimes I will wake up in the morning and be like, okay, I'm really not feeling it today. I'm just going to sleep a little bit longer. Yeah. That'll be my rest day. Now, that's okay. As long as you don't do that three, four, five days in a row. Sure, sure. But to answer your question, when that happens, I think about what the consequences are of me not doing it. You know, it's like, you know, I'm on this special diet because of my kidney disease you know, when those cravings come up, because they do come up, I, I, you know, I was born in the South, born and raised in the Southwest. I lived most of my life in Texas. So one of my favorite things to eat is barbecue, but I can't eat barbecue meat like that no more, yeah. but I still crave. So to push around that and to push around those mornings where I'm like, oh, it's so early. This bed feels so good. You know, how do you push <laughs> through that? Yeah. I think about if I go back to the previous habits that I had before, I know what that looks like. Uh, I know what it looks like. I know what that's going to do to my body. And I know, and I've also had experiences since I've made these changes where I've reverted back to my old habits temporarily. So not completely back, but not following the diet like I need to and slacking back on the exercise and has been able to see the evidence. It's, it's amazing if you have awareness of where you are and what you need to be doing because you've made changes, you can more readily see you going back the other way and the evidence of it going back the other way that made that becomes manifest in your life, the changes in your body. I had picked up 20 pounds and I didn't even know mm. that I had gained 20 pounds that quickly. And I'm looking at myself, I said, this gut's a little bit bigger than it was, you know, <laughs> what's going on? Gained 20 pounds. So I knew I made that mistake. I said, okay, go back to what you know that you were doing right and do it again. And you get back to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. So experiences and knowing that what the consequences are if I don't follow this regimen and stay disciplined is what motivates me to keep going when I really don't want to. Because discipline is doing what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it, regardless of what you feel like. Yep. I agree 100 percent. Keith, this was an awesome conversation, man. The amount of insight that you brought based on your experience, obviously based on your perspective that you were able to contribute based on your value system, and then obviously just your background in an environment that frankly, a lot of people are unaccustomed to seeing from that lens, from that angle, right? Like most of us have been patients. Not many of us have been nurses. So right. yeah, huge, man. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to sit down and talk with you and to get your perspective out and to share it with everybody, man. So again, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Porter. It was a pleasure, man. I had a wonderful time. This was a great conversation. And thank you for having me. Yeah, man, definitely. And I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in, listening to the conversation, taking time out of your day and spending it with us. Also, I guess indirectly, I want to thank TD Jakes and all the patients that Keith has had and Lee Hall and John Maxwell, Jim Rome, Bruce Lee, everybody that Keith brought up, because without them as inspirations, this conversation wouldn't have been as cool as it was either. Man, you brought in so much cool stuff. I really enjoyed this. So I'd like to thank those people too. Thank you to our show partners and folks. Thank you for tuning in and appreciating our value as we all grow through life together. To check out our other conversations, merchandise, or even to contribute through feedback, follows, time, money, or talent, and let us know what you think of the show. Please reach out on our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com. We stream new episodes every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time through all of your favorite podcasting platforms. And we'll meet you there. Until next time, that was Transacting Value.